Uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Raj Bhala. Please, uh, you're all yours. Your Royal Highness, Arab Thought Foundation, Fikr, Dr. Hamad Alamari, Dr. Saud Alamari, Lara, Kadzai, and the entire Fikr team, thank you for uh, having me here. It's a great pleasure and honor to uh, learn from you as well as share a few thoughts. I'm the lawyer on the panel, and so we lawyers like definitions. And our panel is entitled Human Capital and Talent Development. Human capital is something that increases productivity vis-a-vis -vis unskilled labor. And that increase in productivity can be measured in financial terms. We acquire human capital through formal education and through on-the-job training. And we are responsible for our own human capital development unless that human capital is firm-specific. We always see human capital associated with higher income and lower unemployment and also with better family care and better health care. Talent development is not a term of art but it may be defined as a species of human capital, specifically expertise in a field, a field of endeavor like law. And so I would like to address the question, how do we build human capital generally and develop legal talent specifically in the Arab region? And I would offer four strategies. One concerns legal education, and professional responsibility. The second is remember the good old-fashioned values. The third is leverage off the grand Arab Islamic tradition. And the fourth, if there's time, is to say do not be intimidated by China or India. They have serious vulnerabilities. Now the first strategy of remembering legal education and lawyers. Economists teach us that the foundations of economic growth are land, labor, human capital, physical capital, and technology. But what they don't teach us is that the interaction and the efficient use of all those factors of production rely on lawyers and the rule of law for contract rights, for property rights, for intellectual property rights, for business associations law, for secured financing, that is lending against collateral, and for adjudicatory mechanisms to resolve disputes. The Sharia has all of the elements in it. Now, these legal aspects of and foundations for growth are, in other words, the legal foundations for modern market capitalism. One example, Exhibit A, as it were, of these elements in the Arab world is the legal team at Saudi Aramco. It's a team very much built and developed over 30 years by Dr. Saud and his colleagues. And in uh, every two years across those 30, they produce top legal talent, Saudi legal talent, sent them to law schools in the United States where they got a Juris Doctor degree, not a one-year LLM degree that's basically an opportunity to party in America, but the hard work of a JD degree. And they all passed a U.S. bar exam. That's a robust, sustained pace of training lawyers, one about every two years when it takes three years to get a law degree, so that's pretty good. How do you do that? Well, you need a good legal education system, one staffed with professors who care about teaching, who devote their attention to it, and they don't need to earn money on the side through practice. The incomes for the law professors are sufficient so that they're not distracted by private practice. The law schools must offer a curriculum that reflects traditional Socratic thinking and problem solving, not parroting back memorized knowledge. And here may I say, and it's politically not correct to say it, 
There is no better legal education system in the world than that in the United States because it trains sharp legal analysis. It trains people after four years of undergraduate study where they've had to study engineering, math, science, or something else, and then come to law school, and it sharpens their minds. That's why the JD degree is the envy of the world, and that's why one of the darlings of the conference, Korea, is converting to an American-style JD system. In addition to have good, good in addition to have, uh, in getting good law schools, it is essential that the government gets out of the way. Frustrating it is when we have to go to country after country in the Arab world to get a course approved on WTO standards when the country has joined the WTO and get Ministry of Education approval simply to add a new course to teach international business law. It takes months if not years. We must allow curriculum innovation to be market driven and occur at the professorial and even sometimes the student level. Now a second key component in terms of the legal foundations of human capital and capitalism more generally is professional responsibility. We can train the top quality legal talent, but if they're idle or corrupt, then they're useless or damaging. We need model rules of ethical conduct. We have those in the United States. They're called the model rules of professional conduct, and they include three basic principles. Avoiding conflicts of interest. A lawyer has to represent zealously her client and not another client simultaneously or contemporaneously who has adverse in interest to the first client has to have just one dedicated heart to the client. Second, transparency, especially in respect of billing clients. Fees have to be reasonable and be clear up front. And third, competence. The lawyers have to be competent in what they're doing. They require some specialization and specialized knowledge. This is a time-consuming process, and it's painstaking. It, there, there are no shortcuts. In my hand is a doctoral dissertation from one of our top students at the University of Kansas. He's from the United Arab Emirates. He's doing it on WTO standards and electronic commerce. And you may not be able to see, but basically you can see all the work he put into this 200 plus pages and all the work it takes to correct it. And this is three years of labor. So it is a, is a time-consuming process, but as I say, it's well worth the effort in terms of the payoff of human capital. <coughs> Dr. Bhala, you still have one minute. No problem. Uh, second uh, strategy is remember the good old-fashioned values. Hard work, discipline, balance, no fear of failure, taking risks, and at the same time, no fear of success, and naughtiness, be willing to, to push, as we say, the edge of the envelope. The third strategy, leverage off the great Arab Islamic tradition. I've been blessed over the last three years to get to study the Sharia, write a textbook on Islamic law for the U.S. and other English-speaking markets. And it's evident that in this part of the world, you have great legal thinking over centuries. The United States inherited, England inherited, many of our most cherished legal concepts from Sharia scholars. Ijab and Kabul, that is offer and acceptance, basic in contract law, is an example that came from the Sharia. Waqaf, charitable foundations, direct link. So leverage off that grand legal tradition that is here. Final, uh, fourth strategy, which maybe we'll have more time in the question and answers to talk about, don't be over-dazzled by China or India. There are serious vulnerabilities. We'll be happy to talk about some of them uh, if there's time later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. <laughs> Mr. Salman.
first call on with the presentation. No, okay, thank you. Distinguished participant, it's very late. Thank you for waiting. Uh, I'm pleased to speak to you, Your Royal Highness, the board of Arab Thought Foundation. I'm very thankful to invite you to the Fikr conference. I want to tell you something about Arab migrants in Europe, a very important group, and in the future there are some very important developments. And uh, I want to speak to you about solutions, how to bring them in a better position than they are today. And uh, if you look on this picture, you see, yes, it's not an Arabic country, it's Berlin, because uh, the country where I am coming from, where I live since, as a migrant since much of years. And this picture shows you in Berlin, uh, it's uh, an Arabic architect uh, built this, so you see that Arab people are bringing culture and very nice things to other countries, to the European countries too. And if you look on this, then you have to know that uh, Arab migrants in Europe have a great potential for the Arab and the European future. And we, my organization, have an idea to make this resource blossom. The Arab migrants in Europe could naturally bridge the two sides of the Mediterranean. They can do it economically, they can do it socio-politically, they can do it culturally, and they can do it with intellectual relationships. Our pre-study describes the situation of the Arab migrants in Europe. We, uh, the Arab migrants uh, embody a great potential for change and productivity like the other migrants too. By their belonging to the Arab and the European world, the migrants can develop a capacity for cultural diversity as an essential prerequisite for long-term success in the globalized world. Europe needs migrants, ladies and gentlemen, and receiving and integrating migrants has been increasingly recognized as one of the most promising strategies for European future development. And if you look on uh, the uh, developments of the last 10 years, then you have to know that 5.5 million people, mainly former third country nationals, have acquired citizenship of a European Union member state. And in the European Union, almost one new citizen of this 10 was a former citizen of Morocco. So, if you look, but, but if you look on this uh, situation, then we could imagine that if they are citizens, they can elect and they can uh, elect and, 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 and have power resources. But if you look on the reality, they have not much of power resources. We look, for example, to Germany um, uh, at the percentage of different ethnic minorities receiving social benefits in Germany. Then we look on the Lebanese one, on the Iraqi one, on the Algerian one. They have 40, 60, 90 percent of them who are receiving social benefit in Germany, but only 7.5% of the German population are receiving social benefits from the uh, governmental organizations. If we talk now about the Arab population in Europe, then I focus three groups. One group is the middle class educated professionals, doctors, journalists, and so on. The second group is the mass of migrants, worker, unemployed one, the refugees, and the third one is the Arab migration elite in the European Union, members of parliaments, entrepreneurs, intellectuals, and so on. So we have to see these three groups. And the reality is that these three groups don't work together. And that is what they dispower them. And the technology, the social technology we developed is the MIMI key technology for integration of migrants. It's our solution. It's a solution and for energizing empowerment by bringing the three groups into a systematic context. So we bring these three groups together and um, the goals of MIMI, this technology, this project is with migrants for migrants, uh, is a higher qualification, is better image, is entrepreneurial skills, financial competence, healthier lifestyle, better career chances, changing unemployment in jobs and looking for young Arab Thought Foundation ambassadors in Europe, for example. And the WHO identified in 2008 this technology as, the best, as one of the best practice models 
best practice models for the inclusion of social marginalized groups. It's researched by the WHO, it's researched by Hanover Medical School, by uh, Munich uh, University. So it's a technology which is very, very known in the European Union as well in Germany. The principles of MIMI, this program, are to empower migrants through participative processes, to train integrated migrants, to design, conduct and self-evaluate community-based prevention campaigns, and to value migrants as experts in their own situation. The model is that the model one, you see there the model one, is the mediator training. We identify the best migrants. We are looking who is well integrated, who is well educated, who speaks very well languages, and we take them and we say, we say to them, work with us together, we have to empower your people together, you are the elite of this group and you have responsibility for this group, so come and train, with, uh, come in our training, we learn you how to organize campaigns and, and how to motivate your population and so on. Then we organize with them together health campaigns, education campaigns and such things. And we give them health guides, we have booklets and so on in several languages. And this process we evaluate every time so we can make the program in every step better. If you see a problem or something is going wrong, then uh, we are on a higher quality in this project, so then we correct the pro program and make it better. And we have a very, very successful public relation and networking uh, concept. So uh, in one year, more than 250 newspapers uh, I've wrote about this project or journals, so it's a, a very important part of this project. Uh, now we are present in 51 cities in Germany. You see the black, uh, the, the yellow sites. These are the sites in which MIMI is working. And we are present now in seven sites in, in, in Europe, in Tallinn, London, Brussels, Istanbul, Rome, for example. And you see in the, east, in, uh, in the east, in the west, in the north, so everything is everywhere working very well. It's a great, it's a big project family. The European Union's Executive Agency for Health and Consumers is one partner, Ashoka Foundation, Schwab Foundation, um, and the Davos World Economic Group is a partner, is International Organization for Migration, World Health Salman. Organization, and so on. One more minute. Yes, and you see here some, uh, some uh, impressions from this training.